The 2015 offseason will be filled with several high-profile questions involving your Detroit Lions, including Endowment and Sue being the hottest commodity on the free agent markets. And what about the impending future of running back Reggie Bush? And Carol Austin returns for his second season as Lions defensive coordinator. What sort of an impact will it have on the Lions' top five rated defense? Those are just some of the hot button topics I had a chance to discuss with Carlos Menores, Lions beat writer for the Detroit Free Press. Let's jump right into it, Carlos. Obviously, Endowment and Sue is the hottest free agency commodity on the open market this year, and the Lions brass has said that they're uh, cautiously optimistic a deal could get done. Do you share that same optimism, and do you think Sue will be back with the Lions? Uh, you know, Kevin, I don't share that optimism. Um, my general stance on it is that if Indominus and Sue wanted a deal done, he would have had a deal done before this season. Um, now, there makes no sense for him to really get a deal done with the Lions because with free agency coming, that gives them so much more leverage. Uh, to get a better better contract, better contract on the open market with the Lions or on the open market. Um, but if he hits the open market, the Lions are competing with way too many teams. So the whole question is the franchise tag. Will the Lions use the franchise tag? That's basically the only way to ensure that they keep Sue. Um, I just don't know. Sue's a different kind of guy. Um, I don't think that forcing his hand, strong arming, and Dominic and Sue is a good idea. Um, he believes he controlled the draft. Um, he held out in his rookie year before he signed. Um, so there's a lot of willfulness to Sue, and that's completely his right as an NFL player. Uh, I just don't. I just don't think he wants to necessarily. I think he wants to see what his value is on the open market rather than just confine his potential to Detroit. Well, that being said, obviously uh, Nick Fairley is becoming. Uh, a bigger piece of the puzzle for the Lions, especially if Sue doesn't resign. Uh, but he does have some legal troubles that he's trying to overcome. So how do you think his legal troubles will affect this free agency process? And what are the chances he's back with the Lions uh, next year? Uh, legal troubles, I don't think that should be an issue for him. I think with the Lions and Fairley, too much history. They've seen they've seen too much of him. The injuries, uh, the weight fluctuations, the motivation issues. Um, you know, I mean, he, he came in as a, what was it, the thirteenth, I think, overall draft pick right after Sue. Has a lot of potential, a lot of athleticism, but he's he just hasn't really lived up to it. He hasn't been consistent enough. That's why the Lions didn't pick up their fifth year contract option on his rookie year. So they could have basically had him for a song this year. But I think they've seen enough from him. Even though he played well in the games he played this season, you know, again, he got hurt. He missed nine games, including the playoff game. I think they're just ready to move on from Nick Fairley. And in terms of Reggie Bush, uh, uh, Martin Mayhew has been very noncommittal about his future with the team. So what do you think his future as a Lion holds? And do you think his uh, time with the Lions is over? Uh, yeah, I mean, I think silence speaks volumes, and at the Combine, one of the things that Martin Mayhew said was he kind of said he thought he was a free agent, which was not right. He's not a free agent. He's got two years left on his deal with the Lions, but that tells you how Mayhew's thinking of him, um, that I don't think he's long for the world with the Lions. Um, he'd have to take a severe contract uh, cut, pay cut. I don't know if he's really, really willing to do that. I think he'd rather just get, you know, paid out, whatever the, the settlement is, and then move on to a different team. Even if it's a, it's it's a it's an ego thing partly too, and a pride thing. You know, these guys don't want to just say, "Well, uh, I was hurt a little bit," and and Reggie does feel he was hurt a lot this year, and that didn't give him a fair chance to show his potential. Um, but I just don't think he's been quite the the missing component, the job at best guy that they wanted him to be. He showed flashes of that last year, or his his first year with the Lions in 2013, too hurt too much this year, not explosive enough, turns 30 um, next month. So I think that also with a deep draft class and running back, they're probably going to move on from Reggie. 
A detective, Jim Caldwell, you had the club do an 11 and 5 season a year ago and the playoff berth. Why do you think he was so successful? What was his biggest impact on the team? And the second part of that question would be how could Caldwell and the Lions improve on their standing from last year? Well, you know, it's funny with, with coaches, Kevin. Um, they they get a lot, they're kind of like presidents. They get too much credit when things go well and too much blame when things don't. Um, remember that he inherited a team from Jim Schwartz that was really close to clinching the NFC North last year, and then they just fell apart at the end. And that was probably, the problem with Schwartz was he couldn't keep it going all year. So they wanted that consistency. And Caldwell kind of brought that. He sort of settled everybody down brought some sort of idea of equality. You know, I'm going to treat everybody the same. I'll call Stafford out in a meeting if I need to. Um, so I think players appreciated that. Um, and, you know, but this is a pretty good team coming into the season. It, it just um, failed to deliver at crunch time in 2013. In 2014, Caldwell showed that they could consistently stay, you know, as a pretty good team, not an elite team, but a good team. Um, and he gets a lot of credit for that. And I think a lot of it's just people respecting, you know, Caldwell that he was being fair with everybody. Um, what can they do? The second part of that uh, to improve next year, you know, that's a good question for Caldwell because this is going to be, you know, he's going to sort of start shaping the team more in his, you know, manner and his preference. They'll get rid of some players. It's just normal attrition. They do have a lot of free agents, in like twenty free agents or so. So, so he has a lot of opportunity to bring in guys that he really wants. Um, you know, I think Caldwell learned something about um, sort of this is his first chance to be a an NFL head coach without sort of the yoke of pressure or expectations of a Tony Dungy like he was in Indianapolis. He got to be his own man. Um, struggle a little bit with uh, with the media sometimes, uh, keeping his cool. Um, so he can improve on that, and I think he even recognizes that he needs to um, keep his composure, not get rattled. He's going to get tough questions. At the end of the season, he was calling us the Legion of Doom because we kept – you know, he, he kind of thought – and this is kind of interesting for a head coach being – sort of naive this way is he thought, well, if we're winning a lot, you guys should just be happy and, you know, roses and sunshine. It's like, no, when guys are getting suspended and Stu stomping on somebody and Rayola's getting suspended, you know, we have to ask those questions. And it, it seems like it's going to be negative, but those are questions that need to be asked. And no matter, you know, if you're 14 and 0 or 0-14, we, we ask the same questions. So I don't think he understood that quite about how, um, uh, I guess relentless we could be about certain topics, but um, yeah, the roster he can he can start affecting his own will on the roster and uh, maybe dealing with us and you know maybe media in general, but other people I don't know how far it extends to staff or players. If you got I don't know, felt a lot of pressure at the end of the season, but uh, you know everybody learns a little bit and improves, so I would expect the same from Caldwell. And in terms of the coaching staff, Terrell Austin missed out on some uh, head coaching opportunities this offseason, but how big of an impact will his return be to leading the Lions defense uh, this year? You know, there's a lot of pressure on Terrell Austin because, you know, number number one offense for a lot of the season, number two at the end, number one run offense. Um, and the whole question is if Sue's not back. Um, it's almost weird. If Sue comes back, there's even more pressure on him because he better have the number two or number one or at least the number five defense. He doesn't want to show that it was just a, a fluke. And, uh, you know, and that's the question. I mean, part of the reason probably why he didn't get a head coaching job is because he just doesn't have a long enough resume at the job. This is his first time as a defensive coordinator in the NFL. Did a good job as a secondary coach in Baltimore. Did a heck of a job this year, obviously. But uh, player teams want to see that sort of consistent resume being built over at least a few seasons. So, you know, was it a fluke? Was it just Sue? We're going to find out. All the more pieces of the puzzle need to be settled there. But, um, but yeah, I mean, definitely, you know, he knew what he was doing, had a game plan, uh, rallied the players, and he gets a lot of credit. I think the whole defensive staff gets credit for don't forget losing a lot of guys like their slot cornerback. They went through several of those guys. They lost Stephen Tulloch fairly early, and to hear Whitehead came in, and, and they didn't miss much of a beat there. So, 
you know, they, they all get credit. Terrell Austin had that whole effort. But, uh, but yeah, going to be really interesting what he does his second year. And outside of Sue and Fairley, what do you think the Lions' biggest offseason priority will be this offseason? Oh, that's the million-dollar question, right? Every year it's, it's what do they need. And, uh, you know, um, I, I hope people don't want to reach to the screen and strangle me, but a receiver might be very important here. Calvin Johnson is not getting younger. He's getting hurt more often. And as we saw that passing game, there, there, there's, there's a lot missing there. Uh, Eric Ebron was not the guy they thought. That he, was, he didn't catch fire the way they hoped. And that, to be fair, it's a tough position to be great at as a rookie at tight end. So you have to prepare for either Calvin getting hurt more often or, or whatever it is. I wouldn't say that's their strongest need. Um, but, you know, it's hard to say because Rasheed Mathis is older as a cornerback, but he played great last year. Um, you know, uh, running back, that's another question. If they don't bring back Reggie Bush, they do need that home run guy, that explosiveness. And with the draft being deep, that is something that can help. And don't forget, the number one problem with this team this year was the offense. It struggled. They just couldn't score. Um, and that's something, and there's more pieces to that, obviously, with Stafford and them being more conservative, ball control. But they need more. Uh, it's crazy to say with Calvin and Stafford and Reggie and all those guys, but Golden Tate, but they need maybe another one or two pretty good offensive weapons. Defensively, I think they're fine, even if, uh, you know, they, Martin Mayhew has proved that he knows how to find defensive talent, um, whether it's secondary, linebacker, defensive line. Um, but it all depends on, on who stays and who goes. Fairly could stay. You don't know. Sue could stay. They, you know, I, I'm not sure what's going to happen. But it just, there, there's so many moving pieces here. But as the team, left 2014 that offense needed help and that would be my number one concern and whether it's a, a pass catching a running back or maybe a really great receiver outside guy who can eventually take over for calvin you know that's something you got to look at and for is coming up uh, next week or so a couple of weeks from now and with that with that in mind what do you think are some uh, positions they'll target in both uh, free agency and the draft? Oh, you know, that's a good question. It's hard to say because, um, you know, who, who they're looking for, what they need, the guys that are, the guys that there are, their free agents who, you know, obviously they want to bring guys like Matt Prater back maybe or, uh, you know, Rishi Mathis is a free agent. These guys, they, they it's, it all depends on the number and what they settle on. So, um, but I think one, um, I, I, it depends on who's out there, who's available. Um, off the top of my head, I couldn't tell you that there's one guy or one one position, but I would expect, I would say for sure this, defensive line, they're going to bring somebody in as a role player, at least if Sue goes, obviously they'll either draft or, or go get a free agent at defensive tackle. But uh, but they will need to bolster them because Daryl Tapp, uh, defensive lineman, is a free agent. George Johnson is a free agent. I don't know if they bring those guys back or if they get somebody else. But like I said, again, I think on the, on the defensive side, they're pretty good about targeting uh, quality free agents. They just know how to find those guys. It's a strength on offense. It's not quite the same thing. They can't really find those. Golden Tate was an exception. He was a great pickup for them, a number two receiver. So, mm -hmm. um, But I, I would expect definitely um, defensive line for sure. Maybe linebacker. We'll see what happens there. Ashley Palmer, um, Stephen Tullett, excuse me, um, I'm not sure what's going to happen with him, if they can ask him to take a pay cut or whatever. But um, but they'll the, the defense, they'll, they'll bring some, some free agents, and I would expect on the front side, too, on the defensive line. And in terms of Matthew Stafford, to transition into a new offensive system under Joe Lombardi and uh, Jim Caldwell, and it took on a larger leadership role this so where did you see the most uh, growth from him, and wh where does he still need to improve? Um, you know, he showed a lot of maturity, a lot of growth in um, playing within himself. You know, and uh, what we all, everybody knew him as the, you know, the strong arm, Stafford, you know, throwing for 5,000 yards and all that stuff, but also throwing interceptions a lot at the wrong time. So I really give him a lot of credit for for being more controlled and being judicious. And even though he's getting criticized a lot, I think even call at some point, and it's true that, you know, when Stafford threw for, thou for you know, a million yards, people said, oh, it's all just stats, but he's not winning. And then now that he's not throwing for as many yards, they're saying, well, 
you can't move the ball, you can't score, you know, but the Lions are winning. So at the end of the day, you just need to win. Um, I think that he's going to probably get a little bit more comfortable in the offense, maybe. He and Joe Lombardi will work on it. It was a it was a work in transition, and obviously Joe Lombardi's first year as an offense coordinator, too. So I think they're going to learn. They learned a little bit about each other, what works, what doesn't. Um, I liked how he played in that Dallas game, actually. He was a little bit more aggressive when he needed to be. I think down the road, down the, toward the stretch, down the stretch of the, at the end of the season, he learned to be a little bit more selectively aggressive, and I like that. It wasn't just looking for Calvin or just throwing it deep or throwing, you know, sidearms through these little windows up the middle. So um, he's learned to play within himself more. I think he knows that that's safer living. Um, he got sacked a lot, and they weren't always just these, you know, huge bone crunching sacks. A lot of them were coverage sacks. They were he ran out of bounds. He got, you know, that's a sack. So um, he's going to have to learn a little bit more about, you know, um, getting rid of the ball a little bit faster maybe. There were some issues on the offensive line that contributed to that. But, uh, yeah, not, not taking as many sacks for his own good and uh, maybe being a little bit more aggressive when he needs to be, you know, more comfortable in that system. And in terms of special teams, the Lions really struggled uh, through certain portions of last season with it. They rifled through three three kickers uh, before eventually settling on Matt Prater. So how important will it be to get him back, and how would you grade the special teams as a whole? Oh, special teams, um, they, they'd have to be a, it, it'd have to be a pretty low grade because not only Prater, but, you know, Jeremy Ross struggled. Um, you know, they struggled on some coverages, uh, you know, so, I mean, I would, I would give them a D probably something like that, you know, failing grade because it just was not good. And especially early with the kicking troubles. Um, and one thing that, you know, um, what we saw in camp was we believed the writers, the media who were there every day, we believed that Giorgio Tavecchio was as good or possibly a hair better than Nate Freeze, their draft pick. But he freezes a draft pick, so um, there's a lot that goes into that, political considerations for all the coaches who vouched for him and said we need to draft this guy, um, even though he was a, a late-round draft pick. But um, So we thought at the beginning was kind of a mistake to get rid of Giorgio Tavecchio, and then Nate Freeze kind of, you know, unfortunately fell apart early. Um, so um, Prater, they, I, don't, I don't know if Prater's really the kicker he used to be in Denver for all those years, but... He was a stopgap. He did the job. Um, maybe, you know, and I, I talked to him at the end of the season, and, and you know, he agreed that I, I asked him if a full season in this, uh, with this team, working with, you know, the long snapper and the punter, the, that, that snap hold exchange really, you know, it works in concert. It's more than you think with the kicking and the accuracy. So if he works with uh, Sam Martin and Dom Yobach the whole year, that could help his uh, – his chances to improve that that mechanical precision, but uh, bring back Prater, you know for sure. Give him even if you have to overpay him a little bit. You liked what you saw, bring him back. Fine. On the kicking game, you gotta probably replace Jeremy Ross. Golden Tate kind of filled in a little bit toward the very end, but they need to look a little bit beyond that. Maybe somebody that they draft will have that capability. And my final question for you, Carlos. I know it's early. But if you could finish this sentence for me, the Lions will be uh, successful if they do what? If they score more often. I mean, it sounds dumb, right, if you score <laughs> But I would say, yeah, if that offense, that offense needs to take the next step. The defense, with, without Sue, whatever, they'll still be pretty good. There's, there's debate about this. Too many people, I think a lot of people think without Sue, they'd be a, God, whatever, 15, top maybe 20 defense. I don't think that. I think they had enough pieces. But if they, if, if Matthew Stafford gets more comfortable, if they add one or two more pieces, you know, an outside receiver and uh, playmaking running back, I think that will give Stafford some more weapons. Eric Ebron will have his second year in the offense. That will help. If they can score more points, move the ball a little bit more, give the defense just a little bit more help, I think they'll be more successful. Well, Carlos, I thank you for your time and joining us this afternoon on the Two Man Advantage podcast. My pleasure, Kevin. Anytime. For the Two Men Advantage podcast, I'm Kevin McShan.